So we are focusing on the relative extrema portion of this section, and we know that relative extrema is just a fancy way of trying to find the extremes of the function or trying to find the maximums or minimums. And we went through visuals in the last video, so now let's figure out how to do it when we don't have the graph offhand. So I have an example here. Determine the critical number or critical values of the function and classify each critical point as a relative maximum, a relative minimum, or neither. So we're going to follow the exact same steps that we followed when we were trying to find increasing and decreasing, which I outlined earlier, with the exception of once we get our sign chart filled out, then we try and figure out where it switches from positive to negative to specify that it's a maximum, or negative to positive, which specifies that it's a minimum. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do here is we need to find the domain. So this one has a square root involved. So we know when we have square roots, we cannot take the inside of the square root to be negative. So to figure that out, we just take the inside of my square root, and we know that it has to be a positive number, something greater than or equal to zero. Okay, now we need to solve this by rearranging it. So let me factor out a negative and rearrange this in descending order. It gives me positive t squared plus 2t minus 3. I did not multiply or divide by a negative, so my inequality sign stays the same. So if I were to continue to factor that, that would give me a t plus 3 and a t minus 1. Now, if I were to set each of those equal to zero, that would give me the solutions of t equals negative 3 and t equals positive 1. So that's going to be some sort of extremes. Now I have to figure out how that factors in with greater than zero. So I'm going to do a quick little sign chart here, but this is just going to be the derivative to see what works and what doesn't work. So. Remember, I'm looking for positives because that tells us I am greater than zero and I can take the square root of a positive number. If it's positive, then it's defined there. And if it's not positive, then it's not defined there. So if I were to plug something smaller than negative three into my function, and we know the factored version is the easiest to plug it in. So let me plug in something smaller than negative three to see whether I end up with a positive or a negative. So let me do negative four. So if I plug in negative 4 into my most factored version, that gives me negative. Negative 4 plus 3 gives me a negative 1. And negative 4 minus 1 gives me a negative. So I'm multiplying three negatives here, which tells me I'm ending up with a negative. So that tells me my function is negative less than negative 3, which means it is not defined there because I cannot take square root of a negative number. Let me try something in between, negative 3 and 1. The easiest thing to plug in is 0. First, I have my negative that I factored out. Then I do 0 plus 3, which gives me a positive, and a 0 minus 1, which gives me a negative. So if I multiply these, this gives me a positive, which tells me that my function is defined between negative 3 and 1 because they have a square root of a positive number there. Last. I'm going to do something beyond 1, so let me test 2. My first thing is negative. 2 plus 3 is positive, and 2 minus 1 gives me a positive. So when I multiply these out, that gives me a negative over here. Well, I cannot take square root of a negative number, so this one is not defined. So the only time my function is defined is between or equal to negative 3 and 1. So my final answer of my domain is that it is between and including negative 3 and 1. Now you might seem like, well, I have to do this sign chart sort of twice thing. Well, yes, but also this sign chart helps you in quite a few ways because now when I do my sign chart to figure out the positives and negatives for increasing and decreasing, 
I know that immediately I won't have to include anything less than negative 3, and I won't have to include anything larger than positive 1, because my function is not defined there. Okay, step number 2 is to take the derivative of this. Well, let me first rewrite my function into a form that I can take the derivative of. So I'm going to rewrite it as the one-half power. And then when I take the derivative of it, that gives me one-half, I'm using the chain rule, times my inside, subtract a power to the negative one-half, and then multiply it by the derivative of the inside, which gives me negative 2 minus 2t. Two Now, I know in my next step, I'm going to have to set this equal to zero, so it might be easier for you to rewrite this. So, I know that I have a negative one-half, meaning that goes down to the denominator because it's negative, and it's one-half, so I have the square root of that again, so the square root of this here. My one-half, I can either put my two down here in the denominator, or I could write it as one-half up there. I'll leave it down here because I don't typically like fractions in fractions. And then my numerator stays as negative 2 minus 2t. Two now let me simplify this a little bit. I know my numerator all have a factor of 2, so let me factor out a 2, and maybe even a little easier, let me factor out a negative 2. That leaves me with a positive 1 plus a 1t. And that makes it nice because that 2 cancels with the 2 that I put in the denominator. So my most simplified derivative of this in the factored form is negative 1 plus t over the square root of 3 minus 2t minus t squared. Okay, so I just copied my necessary information onto a new page because I ran out of room. I know my domain is between negative 3 and 1, and I just found my derivative. Now the next step requires me that I set my derivative equal to 0, and I solve for my function here. So let me set this guy negative 1 plus t over the square root of 3 minus 2t minus t squared equal to 0. Now, I know that I can eliminate the denominator by doing my magic trick, and so that leaves me with just a negative 1 plus t equal to 0, and so t equals negative 1 is my only possible critical value for this function. So the next thing that I need to do is I need to plug my critical value onto a number line. Now, typically I'd write my number line like this because most of the time my domain is defined for most of the numbers. But we just said that our domain is only defined between negative 3 and 1. So I'm not going to have arrows on both ends of my number line because I know my number line starts at negative 3, and I know my number line ends at 1. So my only critical value that I have on here is negative 1. Now I need to test my two interval. So let me test something between negative 3 and negative 1, like negative 2 and something between negative 1 and 1, and the easiest thing I can find is 0. Now I need to test these in the derivative for both positives and negatives. So this seems to be a pretty nice version of the derivative to plug it into. So if I plug negative 2 in there, I first have the negative that's already there. 1 plus a negative 2 gives me a negative. And the denominator, since it's a square root, and I can only take square roots of positive things, I know that my denominator will always end up to be positive. That's what we did in step one in finding the domain. So that simplifies to be positive over positive. So that tells me that my function is increasing between negative 3 and negative 1. Okay, now I have to test 0. So I have my negative that's already there. Then 1 plus 0 gives me a positive value. And we know the denominator has to be positive because that's the way it's defined. In the numerator, I have negative divided by positive, And so this is negative. 
So this is negative between negative 1 and 1, and so it's decreasing between negative 1 and 1. So that was step number 5 of testing my interval, and step number 6 is selecting my answer. Now, when we went through selecting the answers before, we asked for increasing and decreasing and selected the appropriate interval. But this one asked for all critical values, find all critical values, and classify them as a relative max, min, or neither. I only have one critical value here. The only critical value that we found in step number three was t equals negative one. So that's going to be my answer here. And then whether it's a max, min, or neither, I need to see did my graph go up to down, creating a high point like it did here. And if that's the case, then that is a maximum. If it went from down to up, that would create a low point or a minimum. And if it went from up to up or down to down, that's when we would have this neither. But we clearly see on this one that we have a maximum. Okay, so let us check this by looking at our graph and calculator. So I have my function plugged in here, except for I have to use x's rather than t's, but no big deal. And so let me graph this on the standard window, zoom 6, which I know is going to be way too much because I know that my function was only defined between negative 3 and 1. That's what we found in step number 1 with doing the domain. We can see that it's increasing on the left-hand side of the graph, and it's decreasing on the right-hand side of the graph. So that tells us that we have a maximum in here somewhere. And we know that we can confirm that maximum by doing second calc and then option maximum. So we go somewhere left of where the maximum is because the calculator is telling us left bound. Hit enter. Go somewhere right of where we think the maximum is because the calculator is telling us right bound. Hit enter. Go to where we think that the maximum is. Hit enter, and it tells us again with rear rounding, but no big deal, that our maximum is at the x value, or in our situation, the t value is equal to negative 1. So let's go back and clarify what this problem asks. This asks to classify what our critical values are and not necessarily what the maximum value is. So this is the correct answer here. The maximum value is at t equals negative 1 because it didn't specify what is the maximum value. It just specified to classify the critical value. And so that ends this example here.